Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, and thank you for joining us. My name is Diane Dowdy, and I'm the Associate Department Head and Instructional Assistant Professor in the Health Promotion and Community Health Sciences Department at the Texas A&M School of Public Health. I also serve as co-chair along with Dr. Leah Wiggum of the Live Smart Texas State Coalition. Um, the next slide will show you a little bit about Live Smart Texas. It's a coalition of organizations and individuals who work together to address the state's epidemic of, uh, uh, epidemic of obesity, especially in children. Before we get started, I just wanted to make some housekeeping announcements. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived along with the presentation slides on our website at msdcenter.org. If you have any questions during the presentation, please do enter them into the chat box. We will have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Okay, I am now going to hand over the webinar and um, this presentation to Dr. Colleen Bridger. She was with uh, the City of San Antonio Metropolitan Health District as the health director, but she is now the City of San Antonio's assistant city manager. She's going to start her presentation, 10 things to know about adverse childhood experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, an honor to be with you this afternoon. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. So these are kind of um, hearkening back to the David Letterman top 10 things uh, is how we've structured this presentation. So let's go ahead and get started with number one. Uh, so next slide, please. The first thing that we want folks to know about adverse childhood experiences is what do we mean when we say that? Um, and a lot of people kind of intuitively understand that we're talking about abuse and neglect, um, but that's only half of the equation. The other half of the equation is a category around household dysfunction. Um, so things like, is there domestic violence in the home? Uh, is there substance abuse in the home? Has a relative been incarcerated? Has there been divorce? Um, is there uncontrolled mental illness in the home? These are all things that are also uh, traumatic to children and um, are categorized as adverse childhood experiences. So next slide, please. So on um, the previous slide, we mentioned that it's scored with a 10-point quiz. And so I have copied onto the next two slides the actual questions that are asked um, on this 10-question ACE survey. Uh, a couple of things that I want to mention about this. There is emerging research around 16 questions. So some of you may be thinking, oh, I thought I heard there was 16. Um, it's emerging, and the research around the 10 is really solid, and sometimes this information can be so mind-blowing for folks that I want to keep it um, as simple and concise as positive, possible. So I still go with the 10 questions. Um, the way that this questionnaire would work if it's being administered about children so for example, um, in a pediatrician's office, is the pediatrician would hand the survey to the parent of the child and say, I need you to put a check next to any of these things that are happening with your child. I want you to count up the number of checks that you have on this survey, and then I want you to throw the survey away. I don't need to see it. I only need to know what the score is, which is how many checks do you have. And so that helps the parent feel a little bit more comfortable being honest with the provider about what's happening in that child's life. 
that might be leading to some of the behavior issues that we're going to talk about in a second. So on this first slide are the questions specific to abuse and neglect. Um, next slide, please. These questions are about that household dysfunction category. Um, so you can see these are some of the things that can happen if there is a parent who um, is addicted to substances, for example, um, you know, if your parents were too drunk or too high to take care of you or take you to the doctor. So uh, it's a little bit more nuanced understanding of what exactly are we talking about when we say substance abuse in the home. Um, so next slide, please. So if you count up how many checks you put, because it's inevitable you're going to do that. Um, your score is anywhere from zero to 10. So if you just hit the button again, a little thing is gonna pop up. Um, all right, next slide. All right, so next slide. So what, what we know about ACEs comes from a study that was done 20 years ago. Um, through Kaiser Permanente, and they did a study of 17,000 people who had Kaiser Permanente as their health insurance provider. And I mention that because um, that means that this study population is not representative of the uh, American population in general, right? So these people were solidly middle class. They had health insurance. Uh, and they all worked. And even so, what the researchers found was that 64% of the population had at least one adverse childhood experience, and over 12% had four or more ACEs. Now, what we know today about kids in Texas is that about 15% have four or more ACEs. So you can kind of get a sense of the fact that there's there's already a little bit of a difference between what this study found and what we're finding state by state. Um, next slide, please. So why do we care about ACEs? We care about ACEs because they cause toxic stress. And I always like to pause here for a second and make sure that we're all using the same definition of toxic stress because that term has become quite popular over the last couple of years. So let's look at stress through the eyes of kids and, and differentiate three different kinds of stress that they deal with. So the first kind of stress that kids deal with is what we call positive stress. Um, so the example I like to give is uh, you're in first grade and you've studied really, really hard for the spelling test and you go into the classroom and you're getting ready to start the spelling test and you're stressed out, right? You've got a little bit of that adrenaline going, your, you, your hands might be a little bit shaking because you studied really, really hard and you want to do really well and you're nervous. That's good for kids. That's how kids grow and stretch and become the best they can be. We like that kind of stress in kids' lives. Um, the next category is bad stress or tolerable stress. So that's something, for example, the death of a grandparent. So this may be the first time that a child has dealt with the death of a loved one. That's a very stressful situation. Um, but typically in the United States, we've got a lot of support systems in place to help kids when they lose loved ones. So their parents can help them process their feelings and their emotions. Um, they go to the funeral, for example, they can see that they are surrounded by people who love them, who care about them, and who are also sad about the, the loss of this loved one. So that validates their feelings. Um, and there are lots of check-ins with folks. How are you doing since your grandpa died? How are you feeling? So it's really good. We've, we've got a really good process in place, generally speaking, to help those kids deal with a traumatic event, but that it's one time and that they're surrounded by adults who can help them process and understand what's going on. So 
um, compare that to toxic stress. So toxic stress is differentiated from this bad stress by two things. One, it's capricious. So these kids don't know when it's going to happen. They just know that it's happened a lot in their lives. And two, they don't have um, adult caregivers to help them process how this stress makes them feel. So for example, if you look at domestic violence as one of the, the ACEs, you've got, a, if, you, if the situation is that um, dad is beating mom, um, it can happen at any time. It happens frequently. The child doesn't know when it's going to happen. Um, and, and it often comes out of the blue, especially for the younger kids. Uh, and he can't ask dad why this is happening because he's afraid of dad and he doesn't want to make dad mad. And he can't really ask mom why this is happening because he can tell that she's upset and he doesn't want to make her feel any worse. So that's just an example of it's something that happens um, capriciously and it's something where this child doesn't have anybody to help him understand and process the feelings that he has about it. So next slide, please. So the reason we care about toxic stress is because it harms brain architecture. So what happens in these kids' brains is that um, they're experiencing these traumatic events that's triggering this fight or flight response that all humans have. And you're, you're born either that you go into fight or that you go into flight when you're afraid and you don't have any control over that. Um, but what happens when you go into fight or flight is that you, and you do, if you do it frequently enough, your brain starts to develop around the fact that that's something that the brain needs to do on a regular basis very quickly. And so if you look at the two pictures on the slide, the picture on the left is of a uh, typical neuron in a three-year-old's brain. And you can see there's a lot of stuff going on there, lots and lots of connections going on inside that neuron. Um, and then if you look at the picture on the right, this is also of a three-year-old child, but this is a three-year-old child who has experienced toxic stress. And so what you see in that picture is that there are fewer connections. And what you can't see as well is that the connections that are there are stronger. And that's very typical in a, an older person's brain where you have fewer connections, but the connections that are there are stronger. And I like to joke with um, audiences about the fact that if any of you have ever had the experience of uh, parenting a teenager, you will have experienced what's called pruning. And so that's when you put your um, wonderful, intelligent teenager to bed one night and they wake up the next morning and seem to have forgotten 50% of what they knew. And that is actually what is happening in their brain because as their brain is pruning itself it's trying to strengthen those connections like when you prune a rose bush what grows is stronger and thicker um, but sometimes what they thought they knew the day before they've forgotten when they wake up the next morning and that can make parenting a teenager really challenging um, that's not something we ever want to see in a three-year-old's brain and so the fact that this, there are fewer connections, the connections that are there are stronger, the connections that are there are being built around this fight or flight response leads to what we consider to be inappropriate behavior in these kids. So for example, if you have a, a five-year-old who's in the kindergarten class and his brain has developed around this fear, and he's sitting at his desk, he's minding his own business, and another kindergartner walks in, and that kindergarten gardener looks at the child who's sitting at the desk maybe a second longer than normal, 
um, what the what the child who's kind of walking by and, and looking a little bit longer than normal is thinking um, probably like, hmm, have you had a haircut? But the child who is who is um, whose brain is wired around danger, who's sitting at that desk, he is going to think that person is looking at me longer than normal because he or she is going to hurt me because that's what the world has taught his brain to expect. And so this is where the inappropriate behavior will manifest itself because that child may yell, he may shove, he may push his desk into the other child, which from an outsider's perspective is completely inappropriate behavior and um, highly frowned upon in the classroom setting. But if you put yourself in his shoes where his little brain developed around the fact that the world is a dangerous place that must be feared, and he's on high alert all the time for anything that might be dangerous, then it makes complete sense why he would act the way he acts. The other thing that happens with these kiddos is um, their brains are being developed around current danger which means that the prefrontal cortex portion of the brain is getting less attention and less development. And that's where executive function is located. And that's where the ability to reason um, is located in the brain. So if you're, if you're worried about staying out of danger for the present, you're not going to be putting much stake in Oh, well, if I do these seven things, then in the future, this good thing will happen. Um, and so we see in these kids uh, weaker impulse control, shorter attention spans, because that section of the brain has not been developed. Um, next slide, please. So the other thing that happens when your brain is developing around danger is that it tells your body that it needs to develop around danger as well. Um, so we've got what I call the double whammy that goes on here. So the first thing that happens is um, the brain tells the body, you need to be ready to either fight or flee at any moment. And so the brain starts flooding the body with stress hormones um, that make it ready to be, you know, on guard and able to, to, to move at a moment's notice. Um, the problem with that is when that becomes a chronic condition in um, a child, especially, that can lead to chronic inflammation. And um, when you're a certain age, you understand the the detriment of chronic inflammation. Um, but when you're five years old, you shouldn't be experiencing that. Um, and unfortunately, what that constant um, stress hormone production does to the body is it creates a body that is um, anxious and fearful and stressed out all the time. And so as these kids get older, they look for anything they can possibly find to stop feeling afraid. And so that's where the double whammy comes in because as they get older and they have access to, um, to drugs and alcohol and other addictive behaviors that they engage in because when they're doing that, they're for that moment not being inundated by all of those feelings of fear and anxiety. And of course, we know that when you get addicted to these substances, then that also can make education and job success much less likely for folks. So next slide, please. So what this means is that there is literally a dose response relationship between a person's ACE score and the likelihood that they will suffer from 40 some odd different um, poor health outcomes. And so we're gonna look at those in a little bit more depth in a minute, but I, I wanna pause here for a second and say, um, most of you probably at least mentally calculated what your ACE score was. 
And so this is the point in the presentation where people might be having a bit of a holy crap moment, um, and that's okay. I want you to kind of feel that, that's okay. Yes, maybe you do have an A score of four, and so you're starting to worry about what that might mean, and that's all right. We're gonna talk about um, some solutions later on in the presentation. Um, but what we do know from the research is that adverse childhood experiences have adverse effects in adulthood, not just on mental health issues, but also on chronic diseases like heart disease, cancer, stroke, COPD, and also on a person's um, life potential. So folks with high A scores are less likely to graduate from school, they're less likely to go to college, and they're less likely to succeed in the workplace. So next slide, please. So since um, I'm talking to my public health peeps, I know y'all are gonna get into this um, slide a lot more than some of my community uh, presentations. So there are, a ton of studies that look at the connection between ACEs and um, chronic diseases. And so I took just the top 10 leading causes of death in the United States and compared the odds ratios of if you have an A score of four, what are your odds ratios for developing these diseases? I want to anchor this though with um, an ex a very common example. So if you look at that first one, heart disease. If you've been to the doctor for your annual physical and you're over a certain age, you've probably had a cholesterol test as part of your annual physical. It is something that they do um, every year. Everybody seems to have an understanding um, on a general level that if you have high cholesterol, you're at higher risk for heart disease. What folks don't necessarily understand, however, is that if you have high cholesterol, you are 40% more likely to develop heart disease. If you have an A score of four, you are 200% more likely to develop heart disease. But yet, rarely have I spoken to a group where they raise their hand if I ask them, has your doctor talked to you about your childhood and if there was any tra traumatic events in your childhood that that's putting you at higher risk for heart disease than high cholesterol. And so, you know, this is one of the curious things for me about ACE research is why is the disconnect between um, the research that says, look, this puts you at much higher risk for heart disease than high cholesterol does, yet we're still fixating on cholesterol testing. Um, some of the other things I like to point out from this chart is um, Alzheimer's disease with an odds ratio of 4.2. Uh, we rarely talk about risks for Alzheimer's through the lens of what happened during your childhood. Um, but it makes sense if you think about it. If you think about um, some of the things I said about how the brain is developing around the present and developing around danger and not developing the prefrontal cortex, um, which controls executive function, it makes a lot of logical sense, but we don't often talk about Alzheimer's through that, through that lens. And then the last thing I want to point out is an odds ratio of 12 around suicide. And I don't know about y'all, but I rarely see public health research studies with an odds ratio of 12 anything. Um, so again, why we aren't tying those two things together and thinking about um, how we can help reduce suicide, which is increasing um, with tying that to traumatic events in childhood. So again, back to that whole dose response relationship, this is if your A score is four. If your A score is higher than that, your odds ratio is going to go up. If it's lower than that, it's going to go down. But there's still, even if you have an A score of one or two, you're still at higher risk for 
um, all of these different leading causes of death. Next slide, please. So the big takeaway here from the presentation is that um, if we don't mitigate the effect of adverse childhood experiences, if we don't help people heal from the trauma they experienced in childhood, they can have a 20-year difference uh, lower in their life expectancy. And um, we have a map at the health department where we've looked at life expectancy by zip code, and we um, talk about a lot the fact that depending on what um, census tract you live in, in the city of San Antonio, you can have a 20-year difference in life expectancy between some of the zip codes and others of the zip codes. And I absolutely guarantee you that some of that has to do with um, traumatic experiences in childhood in some of these zip codes and census tracts where um, we have a lot more uh, violence, substance abuse, um, mental health issues, lack of access to services. Next slide, please. So here's an example of different systems where we see significant uh, trauma in the people who are participating in these systems. So from the high of women who are incarcerated, at 98% of them have experienced um, trauma or domestic violence, um, down to the low of 70% of children in foster care who have experienced multiple traumas. Um, this is, you know, this is one of the things that as public health people, and we think about systems, and we think about how we can help improve systems, and then we also think about going up as far as we can to intervene as early as possible. This is where those worlds are colliding and where public health really needs to step up and take a leadership role in shining a light on the fact that if we could prevent or mitigate some of these childhood traumas, we would have a lot less of a uh, strain on our systems, our, our jails and um, our foster kids and our mental health and our, our uh, homeless providers would all see a decrease in the need for services. Next slide, please. So the other thing um, where we have some emerging research that is extremely concerning is the fact that we're, as we learn more and more about um, epigenetics, and how decisions that we make, um, experiences that we have, can actually change our genetic structure. And if that genetic change happens as a result of childhood trauma, which we know it can, then that person can pass the genetic material from their high A score down to their children. And so you have a situation, if you think exponentially, um, that could just absolutely explode. And probably we are seeing some of that explosive growth um, right now in that parents are passing down their high A scores to their offspring. Because the parents have high A scores, they're creating more ACEs in their children. And so these children are suffering even greater consequences as a result of um, that, that genetic transmission. So one of the things that, that research is looking at, looking at right now is, okay, if we can if we can mitigate or heal the effects of childhood trauma, then how long does that take to undo some of those genetic changes? Um, can we prevent that transmission from happening? So that we don't know, and we're still watching to see um, what the research is going to tell us. Next slide, please. 
So this is where um, everybody gets to take a deep breath and relax because we're transitioning from all of the bad news that I shared in my first seven points um, to some of the good news. And the good news is, unlike a lot of things in public health where we're not really sure what the solution to the problem is, we know exactly what we need to do in order to help resolve this issue. Um, and it's called trauma-informed care. So at its simplest, trauma-informed care changes the way that we interact with these kids from asking them what's wrong with you to asking them what happened to you. And just that simple shift as we're interacting with kids helps them start to realize that they aren't acting this way because they were just born bad kids. They're acting this way because of things that happened to them that caused their brains to be wired differently from other kids. Now, we know that the brain is plastic. We know that even if you have a stroke at 65 years old, um, if you get treatment early enough and you get therapy, you can undo some of the damage that um, was caused by the stroke. The brain will rewire. It wants to rewire back to a normal state. It's a lot harder to do when you're 65. It's really easy to do while your brain is still developing. So your brain is still developing through age 26, um, and that's why our focus is on these kids from zero to 26 to help them heal from this trauma, it's a lot easier for their brains to be rewired back to that, um, that kind of default state where it's not about worried of being worried about danger and fear all the time. Um, next slide, please. So we know trauma-informed care works because there's a lot of research about it, but the general public can start to understand that trauma-informed care works because somebody did a documentary. Um, and this documentary came out several years ago. It was pretty popular, so some of you may have heard of it. Um, but it looked at a um, alternative school in Washington State uh, who, after four years, evaluated the effects of having changed to um, a trauma-informed system. And what they found was, as you can see from the slides, their suspensions plummeted, their, they had no expulsions. And, and when I give this talk to teachers, they're like, what? You don't ever not have expulsions in an alternative school. What in the world? Um, zero kids got kicked out of this school. And then their grades and their graduation rates went up significantly. The most important part of this slide, however, and, and that I really like to drive home with public health people especially, is that they changed the system in that school. They didn't screen every kid in the school and say, well, if your A score is four or more, you go to this class and you get extra special care and attention. Um, and if your A score is zero, then you, you go here and you get the normal stuff. I believe that one of the biggest mistakes that public health makes is we target interventions to the most at-risk population, and we end up identifying them as being an at-risk population, which then causes stigma, which then makes it much more difficult for them to thrive. So the coolest thing about trauma-informed care is that you go into a school, for example, and you change the entire system, and everybody benefits from that change, and you don't have to identify kids with high A scores versus kids with low A scores. Next slide, please. So I, I mentioned if you were having your um, holy crap moment that we would get to some things that we can do. And being public health professionals, none of this is going to surprise you um, because it's kind of the who's who list of public health interventions or activities that we like for people to do. But 
if you think about this from the big picture, right? So these kids' brains are developed for them to believe that the world is a dangerous place that should be feared. And that's what they're learning at home. And then they go to school, and let's think about that five-year-old who maybe um, shoved the other child who looked at him a second too long. What's gonna happen to that child in school? So he's acting out because he's afraid. He acts quote unquote inappropriately. And what's gonna happen is discipline is going to rain down upon him. And unfortunately, in the United States, we have a very strong cultural belief of if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. And our discipline system is developed around, we need to scare kids into compliance. But if you think about the fact that the reason these kids are acting out, the reason they're acting the way they're acting is because they're afraid. If you provide discipline because of that inappropriate behavior that is fear-based, you're only making it worse. And so that's one of the other things that trauma-informed care does is it creates these safe, stable, and nurturing environments for kids where discipline, there's still consequences for bad behavior, but it's not done in such a way as to scare the kids. Um, some of the other things on this list, of course, that make a ton of sense because you're public health professionals, um, making sure that kids get enough sleep, nine to 10 hours a night. When kids are sleeping, they're not afraid. That allows their brain to start to redevelop around what brains were meant to develop around, which is that executive function. Um, same thing with exercise. It, when, when kids are running around full bore playing, they're not afraid. We need to look for opportunities for them to kind of break that connection between the world and fear. And sleep and exercise are two really good opportunities to do that, as is creating a system that is trauma-informed. So if they go to school and they're never scared, then that helps the brain not be so hyper-focused on that fight or flight reaction. Nutrition is incredibly important because I mentioned the chronic inflammation. So if you've got a kid who is um, in this chronic inflammation cycle with their brain and the danger in the world, and you add Doritos and um, Mountain Dew on top of that, you're just adding to that inflammation, which is only going to exacerbate the feelings of fear and um, also exacerbate or increase their risk for chronic disease. So mindfulness, whether it's meditation or yoga, is extremely effective for kids. There, um, there's some really good studies out there about the fact that even five minutes a day of meditation um, helps kids focus and pay attention in the classroom. The same thing with yoga. Unfortunately, there are some states that are um, banning yoga, for example, as a religious um, anti-Christian thing. And that, that makes no sense to me. We know that mindfulness helps kids, again, break that connection between fear and their current environment and helps them be able to settle in and pay attention. Um, and then, of course, mental health. Anybody who is dealing with a high A score may need help processing what that means for their for their life. And that's what mental health is all about. Next slide, please. So um, in the last five minutes, I wanna talk a little bit about the fact that um, we're, we're working on this in Bear County. So we have the South Texas Trauma-Informed Care Consortium that we started in August of 2018. Um, so just about six months ago, we started this consortium. We now have over 250 people who are involved, who are members of this consortium. And they're divided up in 11 different sectors. So before we kicked off this consortium, 
um, we had a group of about 100 people come together and identify every potential system in Bear County where kids might come into contact with them. So obviously education is one of those systems, um, but so is the faith community, um, so is the juvenile justice community. Um, and so we identified um, 11 different sectors and, and the 11th sector are our um, funders. So philanthropy is an important member of the consortium because we want to make sure that they are involved in the creation of the work done by the consortium so that they can reinforce that work with their funding decisions. Our ultimate goal of this consortium is to create this safe and connected uh, Bear County. Um, and ultimately what we want is for every organization that works with kids in Bear County to be certified in trauma-informed care. And so we are working on starting a certification entity here in San Antonio who can do that, not just for Bear County, but for the entire state of Texas. Because right now, if you wanna be certified in trauma-informed care, you have to get a consultant from outside the state of Texas to come in and do that work. So we feel like there's a need for that and we are going to fill um, that gap. So um, the last thing that I want to talk about before um, I turn it over to questions is this concept of resilience. And so um, again, you wouldn't be human if you didn't go through and, and calculate your ACE score. And what I often see is that, um, Sometimes people are like, oh dear, I have a high A score. Um, but then sometimes other people are like, look at that. I have a high A score and I'm freaking incredible. I must be special. And, you know, again, I go back to American cultural belief that um, some people have the capacity to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Uh, and I really want to push back on that. I really want to challenge that cultural norm because I've looked at a lot of babies. I've looked at a lot of one and two and three year olds and not a single one of them was born with bootstraps. No human being is born with bootstraps. If you have a high ACE score and you are freaking incredible, then you need to look around and figure out who you need to thank for providing you with that safe, stable, nurturing environment that allowed you to, to develop the resilience that you have in order for you to be successful. So on that note, we'll go to the, um, I'm gonna skip the next slide. And um, yeah, look at, we've got some resources there for you and I am happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Bridger, that was, informative and fascinating. And right now, um, we will go ahead and take some time for questions. Just a reminder, please be sure to type your questions into the chat box. Um, I do see some questions here, Dr. Bridger, um, and I'm gonna start down the line. Um, someone asked, are ACEs connected to conversion disorder? To my understanding, conversion disorder is your mind producing physical symptoms without any biological anomalies um, found in any tests? Can you share your thoughts about that? So I am not familiar with that research, but if you just think about it logically, I think it makes complete sense that the answer would be yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, another question. So there's a genetic disposition for specific ethnicities too um, uh, that experienced those that have experienced biological or historical trauma is that correct so say that again okay there's a genetic disposition for specific ethnicities too those that have experienced historical trauma is yes yeah. Along the same lines, yes. then? 
Okay. Yes, and we do see higher ACE scores in minority populations. Okay, great. Um, another question, from the lens of epigenetics, I'm wondering if the trauma of slavery and segregation has had an impact on African Americans, which, wait a minute, um, African Americans um, has had an impact which has led to the poor outcomes we experience, such as maternal mortality and other things, even when you control for, for class, income, social uh, capital. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so my MPH is in maternal and child health. And mm -hmm. um, for me, that was one of the aha moments is there's there's all this research about, about why do African Americans have higher infant mortality rates than others when you control for everything else, what's going on. And, and some have said, well, it's just this, this constant presence of racism that causes the stress in their lives that causes high infant mortality. And I think that's part of it. But I believe that part of it is also um, trauma experienced in childhood um, that is causing this in, in African Americans. So yes, I, long answer to say yes, I do think so. But valuable answer, thank you. Um, another question, do you know of organization uh, cadres of initiatives that are working with faith-based organizations? This. Um, individual is an outreach uh, is at an outreach center through our church so one of the I told you we had 11 sectors in Bear County one of the sectors is um, faith-based and there's been incredible interest among our faith-based partners in incorporating trauma-informed care into the work that they do, both with individuals and with communities. So yes, this is a really um, logical fit for the faith community. Wonderful. Um, and another question, what is the timeline for the trauma-informed um, care certificate uh, entity in San Antonio? That depends on if you're if you're inside San Antonio or outside San Antonio. Because if you're outside San Antonio, I don't want you to steal our really good idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> but right now we're working on a business plan. Um, my goal is to start fundraising for this entity um, in the next couple of months, and the the process we're using is to um, identify funding for this entity and then allow existing organizations to submit bids to become that certification entity. So we're not looking to start a brick and mortar um, brand new nonprofit that would do this work. We wanna expand on, we've got a ton of um, really great nonprofits who could do this work and we'd like them to expand their scope in order to be able to do it. So my goal is two years from now to start providing the assessment and certification work for our entities here in um, San Antonio. Wonderful, thank you. And they, if they sign up for this certification, they'll have to come with their um, license, driver's license to prove they're in San Antonio? <laughs> that was a joke. We know, we know who lives here. <laughs> Good. Okay. Another question then. Has anyone tried to share uh, this with those making policies at Texas, uh, at the Texas Southern borders? Um, for example, separating children from parents, often uh, children who have endured significant trauma um, in their own home country. Do you know if policymakers are yeah. Um, there have been, so one of my favorite people um, in the ACE world is Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. And she does, um, she does an incredible TED talk about ACEs and what it means. 
Um, she also has written a book called The Deepest Well, and um, it's a it's an easy read. I highly encourage it. I think I downloaded it on my Kindle for like two dollars, so it's not super expensive. Um, and it also goes into a lot more detail um, from somebody who is a pediatrician, but also a public health person, and the work that she's been doing. She's definitely ahead of the curve on this. Um, she has recently been promoted to be the Surgeon General of the state of California. So um, she has less time to tour and uh, give her incredible talks about ACEs, but now she's actually doing work in California to have the entire state become trauma-informed. Um, long preamble to say, she did an incredible job <clears throat> when um, kids were being separated from their parents at the border of connecting those dots. And she was on NPR and every major television station really talking about how this was a terrible idea, um, very traumatic to kids, and that this was going to cause long-lasting harm um, to these kids. So, yes. The other thing I will say is that um, there is legislation in um, Austin right now and I think it's being heard today, um, Representative Tan Parker has introduced legislation to create a strategic plan for the state of Texas around how are we going to deal with ACEs in every single one of our systems and how are we going to become trauma-informed as a state. So I hope that that legislation will be successful and um, will lead to changes uh, statewide. Wonderful, thank you. Another question, where are you finding the Texas ACE data? Uh, BRFSS did a special um, study on ACEs and they did um, not every state every year. So it, I think the Texas data might be from 2016 or 20, I think it might be 2016, um, but it's, it's BRFSS. Okay, great, thank you. Is there research indicating that these strategies work for adults who have a high ACE score? So, yes. Um, it, it's, it's indirect research, though. So we know, for example, that somebody who is at high risk for heart disease, um, the doctor's going to tell them that they need to lower their stress which they could do through mindfulness, improve their nutrition, which we've talked about, and get more exercise. And I think that all of those things are incredibly effective at decreasing your risk for heart disease. We just didn't know that they're incredibly effective because your risk for heart disease was caused by childhood trauma. Um, so, so yes, all of the things that public health knows to do to decrease your risk for chronic disease, they are all effective for dealing with um, childhood trauma and helping people heal from that trauma. So we were, we were doing the right things, we just weren't necessarily doing them for all the right reasons. I understand. Thank you. And then another question, do you recommend any particular providers of the trauma-informed care training? No, no. And um, except two years from now, I'm going to recommend what's happening in San Antonio. But um, <laughs> okay. that's one of the challenges and another reason why we wanted to start our own certification entity, because there are a dozen or so different providers throughout the United States that will certify you as trauma, a trauma-informed organization um, and they've really become very sub-specialized so um, if you're an elementary school then you should go with this group and if you're a high school then you should go with this group and if you're a mental health provider you should go with this group our concept is that 90 percent of this sub-specialization is the same and so our certification entity is going to focus on all right let's let's really wrap our hands around this 90 percent that everybody needs to do 
and then let's look at what additional blocks we need to add to the certification in order to meet this subspecialty, like if you are a mental health provider or you are faith-based or whatever. So that's one of the things that we're looking at is to try to simplify the certification process. Related to that, Dr. Bridget, this is uh, how can I get trained in uh, trauma-informed care and how long does the training take? It's it's related, obviously, to your previous answer, but just Yeah, to sure. and so there are a lot of different um, programs out there that are trauma-informed. So um, I, if you're a parent or you work with kids, I really recommend you look into a program called Conscious Discipline. And that is a, a disciplinary methodology that does not rely on fear to get kids to do what you want them to do. So I think that's a really good kind of introductory training, um, especially focusing on kids. If you Google um, trauma-informed trainings, you'll get a hundred different options. Um, and I'm not going to recommend or not recommend any of those, but, but I do really like conscious discipline as a place to start. Wonderful. Wonderful. There's a very personal question here. And I think this, there's one that, that, um, someone says, I'm, has any work been done to help schools and teachers develop trauma informed practice? I'm conducting a seminar in San Antonio on this topic on May 2nd, we don't want to duplicate anything that has been done in the region. Um, do you want to answer that now, or do you want to have that be a, a response that we email? Um, yeah, let's let we'll chat offline about that one. Okay, okay. Um, I just wanted to be sure the individual knew I wasn't ignoring it. Um, not a question, but a comment. I commend your work to create a community approach. So kudos, Dr. Bridget, absolutely. Thank you. And there's another question, are there resources for employers who have employees with ACEs? So, um, yes, I mean, probably if you Google resources for employers with ACEs, you're not going to find it, but, um, if you are looking for um, some of the, like the aces2high.com website has a lot of great tools to um, help you think about how you could be more trauma informed, both with kids and adults. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then any of the questions, I think we have a uh, uh, we're just about to the end of the questions, but I don't want to go over. So we'll respond to any questions that have not been answered via email, okay? Um, but what I was wondering to, about was uh, someone who asked, do you think trauma-informed care could be included within an MPH program, such as the Maternal and Child Health Program? Yeah, and that's an important nuance about um, being certified in trauma-informed care. So individuals can become certified and organizations can become certified. Our focus, as we focus on the system, is more on the organization. Um, but depending on what your role is, a personal certification in trauma-informed care could be very beneficial. And those programs are out there and it can be anywhere from an hour webinar um, that you don't pay anything for to a week-long training that they'll charge you ten thousand dollars for and you know one of the things that we hope for our certification entity is to be able to vet some of those different options and actually have recommended options on on our website um, but again we've We've only been doing this for six months, so we um, we still have a lot of work to do. Wonderful. Well, it looks like um, we're running out of time, so we're going to have to end this. I just wanted to be sure that you all know that this recording will be on the um, website, archived at msdcenter.org. In addition to that, any questions, and I see there are a few more that have come in, 
um, any questions that we haven't gotten to will in fact be um, addressed by email and answered by email. So, um, Dr. Bridger, thank you very much. We thank everyone for attending today's webinar, webinar and asking pertinent questions. And um, we appreciate all of you being here. Thanks again for joining us today, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Dr. Bridger. Thank you. Thank you.